I'm going to start my presentation with a meme. Um, and, and, and this, uh, Paul shared this about a month ago uh, in our in one of our Slack channels, and I just thought it was great. Because th this is kind of my general feeling about a lot of the AI. It's like, cool, it can do all these things, and you know, you look at actual user needs. <laughs> it's just like, right, but like, why do I care? Like, like that, that doesn't serve something that, you know, uh, that, that I care about or, or you know, may serve your organization, what you're uh, showing as an example, but it doesn't you know, serve mine. So, um, so I thought about what, what business problem do we at Harmonic have that, that is worth solving that AI can help solve? And, and a, very, um, uh, a very present one is how do we estimate accurately? Um, you know, we care about estimates because, we, you know, we want to be able to tell a customer, here's how much it's going to take to build this thing for you. Our customers care about estimates because they want to know how, how much it's going to take. And we also don't want to spend hours and hours and hours and hours estimating uh, and then give the customer a number and then them decide, eh, it's actually more than we're willing to spend. We're going to go a different direction. Well, it would have been great if we could have found that out in a few minutes rather than spending hours doing that. Uh, you know, there's also the, the emotional side of estimating is, is you're sitting there looking at a list of tasks and you, you can go one of two directions. You can go, well, if, if I estimate too high, then the other person is going to think I'm dumb and incompetent because, gosh, what, why would it take you that long to do it? Uh, and so you want to be optimistic. So you end up underestimating. Um, or you go, I just, I, I don't even know. I'm so afraid of underestimating that I'm going to overestimate by so much that it's, you know, you're overestimating by six, seven, eight X, which is, again, not useful at all. So uh, the, I, I'm going to kind of show the power use case that, that I've got here and then kind of walk back through how we got to this point uh, and, and kind of where we're going to go next. So. What I have here is uh, just a just a text file of uh, tasks, of just uh, essentially a, a to-do list for a, a project. Um, I'm going to drop it into this container field and select some options, which I will explain uh, as we go along. Click the button. And uh, I, I, should, I should explain the reason we have uh, uh, Randy's computer here connected to my computer is uh, we are not using OpenAI for any of this. We are using our own embedding server. And for the time being, this machine is our embedding server because we had an extra um, MacBook Pro lying around with an M1 Pro processor. So we said, hey, uh, we already own it. Why send our money to somebody else? Uh, so, so it, it's imported this task list, and it's going to put uh, estimates into all of these tasks, so, and then we get a grand total. And, and that was taking, um, I don't know, uh, roughly 30 seconds or so uh, to rip through this whole long list to do that. Now, the way that uh, we're doing that, so, so we started with asking the question, what, what data do we have? Um, well, we've got seven or eight years of project management data. So, you know, in our uh, project management system, we've got lots of tasks that have titles and descriptions and a bunch of comments. Uh, and then we have, uh, in our timekeeping and, and how we invoice, we have time that's booked against those uh, individual uh, tasks. Uh, so all of this estimating is based on our own internal data. So we took, uh, originally, we took the combination of the title, description, and comments and created an embedding um, uh, of just that, which is this ticket details option that I've added here. I said, I said we, we put together a private embedding server, um, set up a, a sentence transformer that is capable of embedding that, that input into a, a vector. And then we, um, we just uh, drop that vector into a container field. Um, and uh, so what this is going to do is um, 
I'm going to take that task and uh, choose which of the three embeddings uh, I want to use, and I'll get into what those other two are now. Um, and I'm just going to say, hey, estimate that. And this is saying, hey, based on 100 similar tasks, I've set the limit to 100, we think this is going to take 28 hours. Uh, and, and, and what we did, we did that semantic find that you, you've seen uh, previously, and then just did some uh, super basic statistics on it. We just did an average, uh, and then I showed like a min and a max and a standard deviation, right? And then but where can we go from that? Um, now, before I, I jump into how we started refining this data, I do want to touch on how we set up um, our private embedding server, because we're not using OpenAI. Uh, part of that's because, well, we didn't want to pay for it. But also, this is our data, and we don't want to be sending that out to the internet. So all of this has happened completely within network. It's never left uh, our network, never left our office, which is, is great. Um, so. Uh, first, we um, set up uh, an embedding server using Olama, which is just an open source um, uh, AI em embedding tool, and it didn't work. And the reason uh, is, is twofold. The way FileMaker 24 has, uh, has been coded by Claris is it works with OpenAI, and OpenAI's routes, uh, the route pattern, and responses, uh, and so it's expecting that specific format. So, uh, so we can see the difference in the Olama route, which is slash API slash embed, and the OpenAI route, which is slash v1 slash embeddings. So because of that difference in route, as FileMaker was trying to make that uh, API call through the script step that they give us, that was failing. The other thing is in the response. So Olama's response is structured something like this. OpenAI's response is structured like this. And FileMaker uh, is expecting the response to be structured like OpenAI's response. So uh, Randy just built some middleware to uh, convert uh, the route that FileMaker is going to call, which is the, the pattern from OpenAI, and transform that into the route that Olama is expecting. And then that same middleware transforms the response that Olama spits out into the structure of, uh, uh, that OpenAI gives. And, uh, it, and then it works just fine. Uh, but uh, what I just demoed was actually not using Olama. What we did, uh, Wimdecourt has a great article on uh, how to go about setting up um, a, a custom uh, embedding server, and as it turns out, uh, FileMaker Server 24 ships with a Python file uh, on server, and, and it's documented where on the server that gets installed. And so you can, uh, the story goes, you can take this file as is, put it on a, on a different server or on your FileMaker server if you want, and then uh, you're just able to call it. And uh, for the most part, everything that Wim said in that article worked for us, with one exception, and for those of you who are techie that care, I, I wanted to call out the one thing that we had to change. Maybe we were missing something, and this is why we had to change it, but right here. So in the Python, I say we changed it. Randy changed it. He figured out what was happening and, and got this resolved. So. Uh, this line here, 287, that we're commenting out was what was in uh, the Python script that Claris gave us. We had to change that one line of code to this. And the difference in those two outputs was this. So this first line, if we look at the embedding object, uh, the script was outputting np.float32 parenthesis number, et cetera, et cetera. Once we changed that, our output was just a number. So uh, anyway, for, so for, uh, for what it's worth, if you're trying to set up your own embedding server, we had to fiddle with some things to get it to work. But we got it to work, and it was uh, uh, 
smooth sailing from there. So uh, the the, uh, the next thing, so you know, if, if you're going to build a better mousetrap, as my example is here, um, I don't know if 28 hours is actually the correct answer. Um, so we started thinking of how do we make uh, how do we make these uh, these answers that it's giving us more accurate. Uh, so Randy got the idea of well, let's take the uh, the task title, description, and comments, and feed that to an AI, uh, essentially chatbot, and ask it to summarize it for us. And then take that summary and embed that. Uh, so if I choose uh, the second option, which is the embedding of the, the title, description, and comments, and the AI summary, so all four of those things, and I run that again, I get, still get 28 hours. Okay, it didn't change it all that much. If instead I switch to just comparing against the AI summary, it goes down to 23 hours. Well, that's, that's interesting. Which one of those is more accurate? Well, I haven't determined yet. Um, but, so, so there's those different knobs that we can turn. Uh, another knob that uh, Jeremy was mentioning is the cosine similarity. So if I constrain my results to similarities that are greater than or equal to 0.45, I chose 0.45 because in my testing I found with our data that generally produced something that was okay. Hey, now that jumped down to nine hours which, uh, depending on how better of a mousetrap you're going to build, uh, you know, that may be significantly more accurate. But you'll also notice that we're only comparing against 25 uh, tasks now because it, it constrained what we found. Uh, now, the, the next idea that, that we had was if we look at our min and our max here, so the minimum number of, of hours of these related issues was one hour. Uh, the maximum was 64 hours, which seems like a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so, I, so I said, me as a human, knowing what I mean by build a better mousetrap, saying, no, no, it should not take more than 25 hours. Now, even 25 hours, that's, that's a significant investment in a mousetrap. But, um, so this is just going to omit anything that is greater than 25 hours before it runs my averages. Now it drops down to five hours. Uh, it's omitting those things that are, are too big. You, you could also do it in the reverse where, uh, hey, what I mean by build a better mousetrap uh, is yeah, we need to spend at least 30 hours on this. Anything less than 30 hours is just not worth thinking about. So if I rerun that, well now, I've changed it to 60 hours because I'm omitting those things that I, as a human, know don't accept anything that's lower than this number. Uh, the, the next thing that, that I played with, uh, kind of along that same line of the estimation, was um, I, I wanted to uh, exclude outliers, right? So, so if I've got a found set, so let me look here. Um, the data that it's actually looking at right here is these records. Um, and if I look at this spent time column, um, well, there's, there's not really a, a good, okay, here, here's, I'll do this one. Add a print button. Uh, I want to go back to that one. Okay. So the max it's saying is 501 hours for adding a print button, which I don't know seems excessive. I, I, just a little but bit. But does it really? Um, so so I, I can see in here that it has found. I mean, there's something in here. 207 hours that it's found something that it thinks is somehow similar. Okay. Um, uh, 501 hours for something that it thinks is similar. Clearly, it's not similar. Um, or that's a very nice print button. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, uh, printer support included. That's probably why why it's so high, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I added this option to exclude outliers, and the scripting for that is really quite simple. Um, an outlier is defined as something that is greater than or equal to three standard deviations above or below the mean. So once I get my uh, found set here, um, I am going in and finding what is our standard deviation and then just doing a find to omit things that are greater than 3x that away from the mean. And when I do that, that 20-something hours jumped down to 15. And now my max is 162 hours, which still seems like a lot for adding a print button, but significantly less. And so uh, I don't have to know uh, what should my range be. I can just say, hey, exclude the outliers, period. Um, the, uh, before I get into weighted average, because I, I kind of nerded out a little bit on that one, um, Part of this in getting good responses is to know the to know your data. So, um, so the semantic search is, is just going to uh, find similar things to whatever you pass into it. Um, but it's up to you to decide: is this data point even worth considering in our data set? So. Um, I added a number of things in here. So for instance, so starting, starting here, I said, hey, I only want to include things that are done. Right? If we are still working on a task, well then the amount of time that has been booked against it is useless for, for this case. It's gonna skew the numbers. So I'm, I'm gonna constrain to things that are marked as done or closed uh, and only find things that uh, actually have time spent on them. If there is no time spent, well, that's also going <laughs> to drastically throw off the numbers. Um, I'm also here omitting records that have uh, a resolution. So one of the uh, columns in our project management is called resolution. And we have two data points that we've set up. One is called won't fix, and the other is duplicate. So if, if we or the customer has made the decision that, yeah, we put maybe some time on this, but we're just not going to do that for whatever reason, well, then I don't want to include that in my results. Uh, also, if we've marked an issue as a duplicate of something else, I also don't want to include those numbers because they don't really count. And I, as a human, know that they don't count. I, I, as a human who knows my data, knows that they don't count, that I don't care about them for this purpose. Um, uh, then there's some other things. Um, I, I'm omitting these, so, so we have a series of tasks for when we do go lives for customers. And their the title of the task is, you know, build 170, build 171, build 172. Well, they have the word build in them. And so the, the semantic search goes, build, that's similar. Uh, and, and it includes those, and I just go, no, no, that, that is, we're not using build as a verb there, this is a noun. Uh, so I just said, yeah, just, just for those, because there are so many issues uh, or so many tasks that have that title in our data, I just said, no, just, just omit those. Um, and, and some other things like that. So uh, knowing your data. The last thing that I did uh, was I, I wanted to weight the average. So uh, if I look at, at my data set for adding a print button here, and I'm gonna, going to sort by our similarity. So I see there are some things that have a similarity of 0.46, so on and so forth, uh, and other things that have a similarity, similarity of 0.63, right? Well, the things that are more similar, I would like to have those averages weighted a lot more than things that are dissimilar. 
And um, you know, so there's a, a standard, uh, standard equation to calculate a weighted average. Just using the AI similarity as your, as your weight, um, but that didn't get me the results I wanted to see because um, it wasn't weighting them enough, right? So the the uh, the cosine similarity value that's returned is is just linear, and by that I mean the distance between 0.45 and 0.46 is the same as the distance between 0.6 and 0.61, um, and for my weighting, uh, I didn't want that relationship to be linear. I wanted that relationship to be exponential. So the more similar it is, the more it weights. And the less similar it is, the less it weights. So what I did is I created a field. Uh, where is it? There's that. There is. There, okay, here it is. Um, so I created a calc that takes that similarity and just transforms it into an exponential relation rather than a linear one. So this uh, effectively is e to the power of 100 times that similarity. Um, I'm going to change that to 1,000 because I think I like that one better. Uh, but it, you know that started out as five times the similarity, and I went to ten and, and played with the numbers until I found something that felt right to me. Uh, and like Jeremy said, you've got to play with play with this, play with the different knobs uh, to see what actually ends up getting you the best results. Um, so if I use a weighted average. Now all of a sudden that jumped down to six hours. Well, that, that's, uh, and then if I say increase the cosine similarity, uh, it stays six hours. Okay, it's probably because of the, the weighting I was doing. But um, that uh, use of the, the weighting uh, really reduces the amount of time. And in our case here, hopefully makes it more accurate. Um, I can see that the maximum here is still 64 hours, which seems ridiculous. Uh, I'm going to just omit anything that is greater than 30 hours. OK, I still get uh, uh, six hours as the estimate. What if I say omit anything greater than 20 hours? OK, that, that weighting is strong. Yeah, well, so, so that, that's the interesting thing here is, is I actually think, you know, six hours might kind of be reasonable because there's the, uh, if by building that print button, you need to build a new layout that is printer friendly and then fight with all the little gotchas and stuff there and then pass it off to the customer to test and then they go, ah, oh, well, I would like these two fields and could you reorder these and I would like this sort and then that back and forth, by the end of that, you may actually be six, seven, eight hours in. Like that is entirely possible. The, the initial work may only be two hours or one hour. But then there's all the ping pong uh, that, that happens back and forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to try this one more time uh, where the, the, the goal is, OK, um, let's try it with something smaller. So that's just a different file. Um, use the weighted average. Sure, all of that sounds wonderful. So what this is doing, there we go, boom. So it's saying for this task list that I just uploaded, it compared it against our historical data of what it took us. And it's saying, hey, for this whole set of things, on average, we think this is going to take 80 hours. I don't, I don't know if that's true. I've, you know, we're still fiddling with that. Um, but a, a few caveats to this is it's all influenced by the quality of your data. 
right? If, uh, if you're in your project management data, you have uh, one task that you've put 800 hours against because it's just the whole project, that one data point is, is going to throw everything else off. Because um, when you put that much time into one thing, th that estimate is basically worthless. Um, also, if you have lots of little tasks, uh, you know, you, say you've got something tasked out uh, uh, with 10 different tasks, and then you do all of that work against two of them, and you put no time against the others, that's also going to throw off your data. So one of the things that we're going to try to get better at is better project management hygiene, right? Um, so naming tasks better, uh, being more diligent about adding comments to issues. Because if the only comment on the issue is, this is done, <laughs> well, that's, that's not all that helpful. Um, uh, you know, this is done, and, and you've plowed 70 hours into it. It's like, well, OK. You know, if, if it's fix the button and then this is done, that's not a lot of context for the AI to go off of. Um, the, I think the one last thing I'll, I'll throw in is uh, kind of where we're going next that was actually Randy's idea, we just didn't have time to implement it, was implementing the chat with database feature into this. So, uh, like I'm manually doing in the scripting by omitting certain things from my find before I do that semantic search, uh, wouldn't it be nice to, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Wouldn't it be nice if we could enter in the, the name of a, of a task and then based off of that, chat with the database that would give us a SQL query uh, to essentially find uh, things that meet this classification, and then strip the where clause out of that SQL query and add that to our find request to further limit down the results dynamically before we even do that semantic find. Uh, so that's, I, I'm, I'm hopeful about the potential value that that can bring, but, and I'm hopeful about what this uh, tool can do for us internally at Harmonic and, and the value that it can bring in the turnaround time to produce estimates for things, and then that allows us or the customer to decide, is it worth moving forward with this? You know, the faster we can come to a decision, the, the better for everybody involved. Um, yeah. Uh, I almost thought of is, like, you have all this data that has all these descriptions of things. Mm -hmm. Having the AI ask you, the LLM ask you questions, like you put in this task, and they can ask you, you know, is this more like this, or is it more like this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, to narrow down that search as well. Um. Yeah, I, th I think Randy, you had some ideas uh, around that. Um, but that's, you know, but for instance, if, if what we're doing is adding a print button in FileMaker versus adding a print button on a web page, well, that's, that's two different sets of work. Um, and typically, it's going to be a lot faster to do it in FileMaker than it is in something else. So. You know which which team at Harmonic is doing it. What tech stack is this work being done in? That can greatly affect uh, the amount of time. <laughs>